Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on how to train your onboarding agent with AI Habitat. My name is Manola Saba, and I'll be giving you a brief introduction to this tutorial. First, let's talk a little bit about this term of embodied AI. The term for embodied AI derives from embodiment. This term of embodiment is actually uh, related to the embodiment hypothesis, which is the idea that intelligence emerges when an agent interacts with an environment, and as a result of that agent's sensory motor activity within that environment. This quote comes from this really nice paper here by Smith and Gasser, and I would recommend that everybody take a look if they are interested in this fundamental uh, concept of embodiment. When we talk about embodiment, uh, we are interested in the body agents that can uh, physically exist in the real world and take actions in the world, such as, for example, the robot that we see here opening a door and put down a challenge. These kinds of agents uh, need to exhibit some form of human-like AI in order to perform these kinds of tasks. Uh, intelligence that involves active perception of the world long-term planning to decompose tasks into subtasks and then carry them out in some coherent sequence, and then the ability to also learn by interaction with the environment. All of these are traits that we as people exhibit. We learn how to do things in the real world, and we would like to endow our artificial agents with this form of intelligence. Now, in recent years, there has been a shift in the computer vision and related communities from tasks that involve so-called internet AI, um, tasks that involve static image data sets such as ImageNet, to tasks that are more about embodied AI. In this setting, we have some agent that's uh, acting in the real world, like the robots that we saw earlier, uh, then perhaps communicating with people to receive commands and, and uh, communicate uh, the, the, what the robot has achieved after those commands. And also, uh, in the lower uh, right here, uh, agents that are assistants to people in their daily lives. So, for example, uh, assistants uh, in the augmented reality classes that can provide contextually relevant information um, when a person is going about in their daily life. So this is the realm of uh, important AI. And in this uh, realm, there's uh, uh, an important technology which uh, underpins uh, advances, and that is the ability to do uh, simulation. Uh, what simulation means in this setting is to take the statement previously of a physically embodied agent taking actions in the world, and then convert that to a virtual version of that embodied agent taking actions in the virtual world. Simulation has many advantages, uh, including speed, uh, scalability, and uh, safety, uh, and it allows us to carry out experiments in embodied AI at, uh, much more easily. Uh, so this uh, simulation uh, capability can allow us to mirror the successes of uh, internet image data sets on internet AI kinds of tasks, data sets such as ImageNet, Pascal, VOC, MS Coco, and uh, to leverage uh, data sets of 3D environments, simulate within those uh, environments, set up tasks for embodied AI agents, and then have a consistent measure of research progress, which really is a key requirement for enabling uh, much uh, of the success that we have seen in recent years in computer vision. So given this backdrop, uh, let's now talk about uh, AI Habitat. What is AI Habitat? Uh, and I'll try to give you a, a little bit of uh, an introduction of the origins of the Habitat effort. Uh, so Habitat uh, was, was an effort that started at an exciting time. Back in 2017, there were many emerging uh, 3D simulation platforms that uh, used a variety of different uh, data sets to allow for simulation of uh, 
interior environments and also uh, exterior environments. Here you see just a few examples of some simulators that uh, focused on interiors mainly. Uh, and really this activity around 2017 was quite exciting. Uh, there were many, many efforts uh, either using uh, synthetic 3D environments or reconstructions of real spaces. And uh, these efforts were associated with uh, quite a few uh, highly, uh, highly impactful research problems, uh, examples of which you see here. Uh, in the top left, we have visual navigation of an agent from one point in an interior to another point, uh, simulation for improving robotic grasping of objects, um, simulations for investigating how agents can learn to ground natural language statements, uh, or to follow instructions in an interior to uh, navigate from one point to another given a particular uh, instruction of uh, where to go, uh, to map instructions to complete actions and objects, and finally in the bottom right to dexterously manipulate um, objects such as uh, uh, these cubes in the exciting world by opening the eye. So this was a variety of different tasks that were uh, in part enabled by uh, simulation. At the same time, though, uh, despite all this activity, uh, one common thread to uh, most efforts was that they would uh, essentially take the approach of black boxing an existing 3D image in binary. And what this looked like is, for as an example here, to take, say, the Unity game engine to write a wrapper around that uh, that uh, provides a convenient icon of the eye, and then to make sure that it can interoperate with learning frameworks such as PyTorch. Uh, this is just a high-level sketch of uh, some of the early versions of AI people, um, which is one of the simulators at the time. Uh, unfortunately, this approach led to inefficiencies and bottlenecks that uh, resulted in uh, frame rates of uh, tens of frames per second, uh, roughly. And uh, this, is an, this is, of course, not a, a greatest situation because we would like to have uh, high uh, speed for simulation. Uh, and th there's an interesting observation that we can make here, that the, um, the, the results of these simulations are not really intended for human consumption, uh, unlike what uh, the original game engine might have been designed for. So we're not really rendering visuals for a person to have a fun interactive experience navigating uh, around an interior. Uh, we're actually more interested in creating these uh, simulated scenarios to train uh, artificial agents to navigate, for example. And in this setting, we would uh, generally care about visuals that are lower resolution, and maybe we care about several different uh, modalities, such as, for example, surface normals, uh, depth sensor simulation, or even non-visual sensors, such as audio transport simulation, LiDAR sensors and so forth. And we would like to get this kind of data uh, at as high a frame rate as possible to allow for scalable experimentation. So really that's what uh, the Habitat effort uh, started with. It was the question of, can we do better by looking, uh, by recognizing this, uh, this gap between how existing efforts were architected and the needs of a simulation for embodied AI. So uh, Habitat uh, started with that observation and it aimed to standardize the embodied AI software stack. And uh, this started at the lowest level with a look at the variety of data sets that uh, existing efforts have been using, data sets of 3D environments, uh, and uh, then also a survey of the uh, variety of capabilities that existing simulation efforts had focused on. Uh, the ability to do high fidelity rendering, to simulate some physics, to support a variety of different virtual robots, multiple uh, or agents perhaps, and also to allow for humans to interact with the simulation. And lastly, at the highest level, to look at the spectrum of tasks that people had defined on top of uh, existing simulation platforms, uh, such as, uh, for example, the visual navigation and instruction following tasks that I was uh, describing earlier. Uh, the Habitat platform uh, took a look at the state of the field at the time and then um, 
try to derive a general flexible design uh, that uh, allowed people to load uh, any uh, data set that they would care for, to have uh, highly efficient implementations of, uh, of a wide spectrum of capabilities, simulation capabilities, and then to define a variety of different embodied AI tasks with a flexible API. So the, at the outset, uh, we focused on visual navigation experiments in the kinds of environments that you see here uh, to prototype the platform and to see whether uh, a highly efficient simulation could uh, unlock uh, interesting experiments that were up to that point in time not practical. Um, with a little bit of care to the design of uh, the platform, uh, we could scale from the kinds of frame rates that uh, existing platforms at the time uh, were um, uh, have achieved in the orders of tens to hundreds of frames per second to uh, several thousands of frames per second per simulation process. And combining several simulation processes on a single commodity GPU device, we could exceed 10, 000, tens of thousands of per second uh, for a single GPU device. This ability to do highly performance simulation really unlocked many um, experiments that were at that point in time not very practical to uh, carry out. Uh, so with this short summary of the origins of AI Habitat, I would like now to switch to uh, concretely describing a little bit more about uh, this tutorial. Uh, so first let me talk a little bit about some general terminology that will recur through, throughout the uh, modules in this tutorial. Uh, and uh, I'll try to present this with a canonical uh, reinforcement learning loop. So here we can talk about an agent, an embodied agent, that can take actions in a particular environment and uh, receive from that environment some observations uh, to uh, really observe the current state of the environment and itself within that environment. Uh, and on the top here, uh, this agent will correspond to uh, some concepts revolving around the embodiment parameters of that agent, the sensors that that agent possesses, and the action spaces that are available to that agent. All of these are things that will occur throughout the uh, tutorial modules. On the bottom part, uh, when considering the environment, we'll discuss uh, the 3D assets that can be used to create environments, uh, the definition of uh, various tasks and the goals of, within those tasks that the agent might have, and also uh, manipulating important simulation parameters that determine the specifics of, of what, what kinds of observations are available to agents. So given this um, general terminology, hopefully it will be uh, a little bit easier to connect uh, the, the different uh, parts of the tutorial. Uh, now let me give a brief outline of the different tutorial uh, modules. Uh, this is of course the introduction uh, module and uh, a nice uh, module that can follow this is the overview of setting up a simple navigation task in Habitat, very much like the ones that uh, you were seeing videos of earlier on. Uh, that can be nicely followed by the module on uh, basics for the Habitat uh, Sim simulation packet, uh, and uh, also by the module uh, presenting some introductory material on Habitat Lab, the higher level API for defining uh, tasks. Uh, there's also a module that describes uh, previous Habitat challenges and how to participate in future uh, challenges and benchmark using Habitat. Uh, a module that goes into more detail in setting up interactive uh, environments in Habitat Sim, uh, environments that allow interaction with objects. Uh, a module focusing on profiling and optimization of your experiments. Uh, and then a module that goes into advanced features of the Habitat Sim backend. And finally, uh, a concrete example of an interactive task uh, in Habitat Lab. So that's pretty much it. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed this overview and I hope you enjoy this tutorial. Uh, and definitely reach out to us if you have uh, any 
ideas or any feedback about the material that's to further. Thank you.